Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Go in your Bibles into the Old Testament, please, to the book of Nehemiah to the book of Nehemiah. Thank you all who are involved in music and worship, singing this morning, all of you. Just um, always great to see different gifts used, different people involved, and we appreciate all of you so much. Nehemiah chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 5 by itself, and then we're going to go to the end of the chapter. We read through Nehemiah some weeks ago, if you're reading with us in the Old Testament, and even if you haven't started yet or you weren't sure about all of that, you can still join in. You, you can just start reading. The Bible reading plan is available. It was on paper somewhere in our building, but it's also on a Bible app, and if you'll text or email Pastor Pete, he'll... If you don't have that app yet, he'll show you how to just jump on there. and You just click it each day and, and tell it how many chapters you read or you read the chapters. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 5. I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. And the verses that follow talk about the king agreeing and saying, okay, go. Now let's pick it up in verse 16. The city officials did not know I had been out there. He has arrived. Nehemiah has arrived in Jerusalem and is there to assess the situation with the city. The city needs rebuilt. And this is what we read. The city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing. For I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we're in. Hmm. How many of you know the trouble that you're in? Is anybody with me today? I, I, there's, I, there's trouble and I know I'm in it. How many of you, when you get in trouble, are like, I wish I wasn't in trouble? Huh? And I'm, we're not talking about like, you know, school, being in school and, and doing something wrong. Again. We're just talking about life, being in trouble with life. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. Well, I tell you what, you talk about motivation. I wish I had that, right? I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me. And they replied at once, yep, let's do it. Let's build the wall. Now, gang, I, if you have ever been to Israel, you've seen pictures, or if you go with us this coming March, you'll have a grand time. Uh, epic. You will have an epic time. And if, if you're there, there's what's called the Old City. And it's a very small part of modern Jerusalem, but it's still inside these walls. These walls, not other walls, these walls, or this wall around it. It's got multiple gates. It's, it's, some of those gates are still in use today. And you get to see all of that. And that wall is, even today, impressive. And they're looking at it, and the wall is not a wall. It's piles of rock, what they called rubble. Just piles everywhere. Because over the years, the armies had come in, the initial army tearing it down, people afterwards just taking And everybody that needed a rock for the house would say, well, nobody will miss one or two. And so they'd take it home and put it in the wall of their house. Pretty soon, there was no wall. And so Nehemiah says, listen, you know the trouble we're in. 
So they began the good work, 19. But when Sinbalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king, they asked. I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall, but you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. How in the world can we get God's help? Amen. I love that phrase. Look at what he says. The God of heaven will help us succeed. Somebody is here today, and like me, you need God's help. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know if it's situational, relational, people in your family, people on your job. I don't know if it's medical, but you need God's help. Somebody today, tell me, amen, pastor. I need God's help. Come on. Amen. When we come into the house of God, I can't imagine there's ever a time when after the previous six or seven days, we haven't found out at least one thing that causes us to say, I'm going to need God's help. Now, when the Bible uses that term, God's help, it's, it's not meaning like if we do 97%, he'll kick in the last three. It doesn't mean that we're going to do most of it and then God's going to do a little bit. Since he's unseen, he really can't do that much. But, you know, he'll blow on it and there will be fairy dust that will fall down and we'll feel good or something. No, no. When it talks about God's help, that, that's a biblical phrase that means God does it and we get to partner along. We get to watch. We get to celebrate when he does it. In other words, there's something blocking the way. There's some obstacle. There's some mountain that cannot be moved by our strength or our will. It cannot even be moved by our faith, but it can be moved by God. And when he shows up, he'll move the obstacle so that we can do what's necessary to be done. Amen? Like... uh, Like the Jewish people of Nehemiah's day, I believe that you would agree this is a day when we need the Lord's help. We have more enemies than we can count, right? From what's going on in our culture, to our schools, to our government, to our uh, entertainment and media, from what's going on to the news, to the other nations. I was just reading this morning about South Africa, and they're just about in total meltdown. And you can read about other countries that are just losing their mind. Japan decided the other day they're hosting the Olympics this year. And uh, how many of you didn't even know there was going to be an Olympics? I kind of, somewhere along the line, I lost track. But all of a sudden, boom, there's Olympics. And then Japan said, nope. Nope, nobody can come and watch because of coronavirus. And I read yesterday where some of the athletes already, you know it, tested positive, right? So now what do we do? Because people are just losing their mind over this, right? They, they, there's just such terror over this uh, pandemic. And I'm not belittling it in any way, but I thought the evolutionary people said that we had life in some form or fashion had been here on the planet for millions of years and life will go on. Well, then why are you so afraid? I I don't get it. And and most of you want to see a a smaller population globally anyways. You think there are way too many people. Why aren't you happy? Why can you never be happy? I'm kind of having fun right now with the unbelievers. I, I was reading this week, there's this woman. She's some model. Her name is Chrissy Tigan or Tigan, 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 something. And she's famous and an influencer and had her own, I don't know what all, all this stuff and business and millions of dollars. And, and she now, it's found out that she was really nasty to other women with her tweeting 10 or 15 years ago. And all that's unearthed. Well, this week I read where she had to finally, she's made some apologies, but she had to say this week, I, I'm I just don't even know what to do. I can't talk about this because it will seem like I'm whining, but I've been canceled. She lost contracts, business contracts. She lost all kinds of stuff. I'm like, you helped create this. It's so fun now to watch the unbelievers devouring each other. It's just, oh, it's so rich. 
come on. You, you've yelled about the church. You've criticized the church, mocked the church. You've accused us of being hate-filled. You've accu- Listen, no, oh, I've never seen this kind of stuff happen in the church. But we're going to stand back and just watch you guys go after each other. And when the smoke clears and you're all laying there battered and bruised, It'll be the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ that comes in to tell you that there's hope. Just go to it. Hate each other. and As long as the alcohol is flowing, everybody's saying good stuff, they all say, oh, we love each other. That love's about a quarter inch deep, right? Oh, wow. Anyways. <laughs> the enemies we have. Oh. Now, these guys, you can look them up, the three that are listed there. They're not sure exactly who all they represent and where they come from. They're probably uh, Moabites to some extent. And there's also a representation, we believe, of the Samaritans in this group. And so people that are there in Israel but not the Jewish people in Jerusalem. They've been taken away captive. They've been hauled off to Babylon. They've started to slowly come back. Ezra has led a group back and others have come back. But now here comes Nehemiah onto the scene and he says, listen, I'm going to tell you something. The God of heaven will help us succeed. How how do we find that kind of help? Go with me now to chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4 and look at verse 19. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people, the work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Well, then let's quit, Nehemiah. We can't, there's nothing we can do if we're all spread out. And, you know, there's churches here, and there's churches in China, and churches in Russia and Africa, and, well, we all might as well quit because we're all spread out, and we're widely separated from each other. But... I know it doesn't say that. I'm adding that. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, (laughs) who's listening for the trumpet this morning? I got any people listening for the trumpet? Glory to God. There's something about trumpets. I don't know why God doesn't like the whole band, but he just something about trumpets that God seems to love, right? (laughs) Uh, Well, I was getting ready to go somewhere there with musicians, but I'm not going there. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it's sounding, then our God will fight for us. We worked early. Verse 21 says, and late from sunrise to sunset. Number one today, you and I, if we're going to get God's help, we must know he will fight for us. We've got to know that. God wants to fight for us. He will fight for us. But pastor, I've prayed 10,000 times over things that I've been dealing with before, and I don't think God ever helped me one time or maybe three or four. But lots and lots of times, I never saw God. I never felt God. Nobody ever came along and patted me on the back and said, God really showed up for you. God did a miracle. God did. Listen, all of us struggle with how God shows up. All of us struggle with the fact that it's hard to see that he was there until after. Sometimes many years after. But because we belong to him, we are able to know that he's fighting for us by faith. By faith. Now, I'm setting you up this morning. There's something that's already taking place here that you're going to find out later, the importance of it. But you get knee-deep into all the weeds here with Nehemiah and the building of the wall and what the, the accusations of the enemy and the attacks and how they got a sword in one hand and, and a, ro- a trial in the other hand. I don't know how they fix this wall with a trial in one hand and a, rock, or a sword in the other hand. How are you supposed to grab the rocks and put them in place? It, it's just almost impossible to do what they did. It's just almost impossible. Now, what, what Nehemiah says to them is, listen, whenever the trumpet sounds, we all get to tighten up. Keep listening for the trumpet. And as the trumpet prepares, as, as you're listening, make sure that you're prepared to tighten up. Church, I want to tell you today that you and I, as we're listening for the trumpet to sound, we've got to be willing to tighten up. And it's the love of Jesus Christ that's going to tighten us. Listen, I know you're upset about America. I know you're disappointed in the culture. And I know that in some ways you're angry about this, that, or the other. But do you understand that it's not a bad 
thing. God's letting all of that happen because that gang is that gang. But we are the church of the living God, and he's using everything happening to tighten us up one to another in love. See, when everything out there finally goes to ruins, when everybody has devoured each other and canceled one another, see, they all thought four or five years ago they were going to cancel all the believers. But Satan's greedy. There's a small number of us. So when he's done with us, he's going to cancel all them. They just don't realize it yet. They're too blind. I wanted to say stupid. I didn't. Blind. Right? They're, uh, they're not aware. They're not discerning these things. They can't discern. But for the believer, listen, God is doing something through all of this. You're eventually not, you just won't even be able to process how much garbage is going on outside of your spirit. How much incredible human garbage, waste, crud. Is happening outside of you. And so the only thing you're going to be able to do, the only support you're going to have, the only encouragement you're going to have is the brothers and sisters in Christ that you know. And as we're listening for the trumpet, we're going to tighten up. We're going to rush to that place wherever we think that God is going to be able to use us to do something marvelous. We're going to recognize that the only way he can do it is together. Not with the world. Not with compromised churches, but with believers who love Jesus and are looking for his appearing. Isn't that great how the apostle always put that together? To those who look for his appearing. But listen, he ain't appearing until the trumpet sounds. You and I, like Nehemiah, we've got to be listening for that trumpet. And we're always looking at our brothers and sisters and recognizing that they have their part on the wall and we have our part. And we are pulled together, tightened together by the love of God. That's what draws us. That's how God works in his people. And while that's happening, we're listening for the trumpet. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. He shall. I don't know what's going to happen with the, the tech guys out in Tech Valley or Silicon Valley. I don't know what's going to happen with the governments and, 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 and China. And I don't know. But I know this. The Lord himself from, from heaven. Yeah. Not from Egypt. Not from some dry well over in Saudi Arabia. But from heaven. The Lord himself shall descend. He shall. He will. Yet a little while and he that shall come will come and he will not delay. I'm listening for the trumpet because the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice, the archangel, and the trumpet blast of God. And you and I are going home, baby. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Hallelujah. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. We're going in together. They're not going without us. We're not going without them. We're going in together. Hallelujah. I love that, that we are going in together. Listen, this isn't like, um, I, I know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But there's a resurrection. And even those of our loved ones who are with Jesus now have not arrived the way they're going to be. And, and I, I don't understand all that, but here's what I know. There's a resurrection that all of us experience so that we can go in together. Here's the second thing. If we want God's help, here's the second thing. Look at chapter 6, verse 11. Chapter 6, verse 11. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? Um, yeah, Nehemiah, you should. Wear three masks and be vaccinated 12 times over, once in this arm, then that arm, then both legs. Uh, and also, Nehemiah, you really should stay in your house and never come out. No, I won't do it. I realized that God had not spoken to him. Now, if you look at verse 10, you find out that it's Shemaiah that comes to him and says, hey, let's meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the doors shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. I realized, verse 12, that God had not spoken to him. 
but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Verse 13, they were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Number one, we must know that God will fight for us. I don't know what he did yesterday in your life. I don't know how many disappointments you may have experienced. All of us do. But I do know that he is fighting for you as you are following him. I know that he's fighting for you because that's his promise. And he can't break his promise. And if he breaks his promise, Satan is king. Satan is Lord. Satan is God. So until Satan is on the throne, I'm assured that God's fighting for you as you're following him. The second thing we have to know, if we want God's success or God's help in our success, we must know what he has said. Much in our day that is supposedly prophetic is not. It's just not. And this is so incredible, isn't it? Nehemiah, in the midst of the stress that he's got, the incredible burden to to come back to this city and to do the work of the Lord and all the opposition, people accusing him, telling lies about him, working against him, cursing him, all the things that they're doing. In all of that, he's able to discern this guy is not speaking for God. Now notice what he says. There are people who are going to kill you. That's true. There are people who are trying to kill Nehemiah. That's true. And this is what gets us in trouble in prophecy. This is what often pulls us in and then it's able to deceive us because there's always, at least what I've heard, there's always a part of the prophecy that's true. And so I want to warn you, I want to caution you that in every day and time, but especially in this day and time, when there are many deceivers and the spirit of Antichrist has nearly brought forth his man. Notice I said nearly. There is much prophetic deception. Because many prophesy what they want to see happen. Many prophesy what they want to see happen. That's not prophecy. That's wishing. (laughs) And then putting a spiritual ribbon on it. Now you can say, Pastor, prophecy really doesn't affect me. It doesn't have anything to do with me. But I'm going to tell you something. If we look back over the past year, a lot of prophecy in our nation caused a lot of people in the church to do or react certain ways to certain events, especially politically. Well, some of you must know I'm talking about because it got really quiet. Prophecy is not you saying what you want to see happen. Prophecy is when God is speaking through somebody. And you know, one of the things I find most incredible about prophets is whenever the prophet in the Old Testament said to his servant, you go with the woman because there's something that's happened. God, I'm, I'm, paraphr- I'm putting this in. God has allowed something to happen. And then the prophet said, but he has not shown me. Do you see the part that I added? The Bible says, the prophet says to a servant, go, because God has not shown me what the problem is. But I'm adding a phrase there because this is the intent from Genesis to Revelation. God is doing. God runs the world. God is the steward. He's aligned up everything, controlling, governing everything. Nothing happens except it happens by God. I think a lot of prophets need to learn that phrase, the Lord has not shown me. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. Because God will not show you or me or anybody else. He'll not show any apostle, any prophet. He will not show them everything that's going to happen in life. It's not possible. Life is life. It's 24-7. Nobody prophesies 24-7. Amen? So I know I'm being a little bit cryptic here, and you might be saying, well, I don't understand why I should be concerned about prophecy. It really doesn't affect me. Well, in some ways, as many who are not Pentecostal would say, all preaching is supposed to be prophecy, the declaring or putting forth of God's word. And that's true to an extent. But there's also this spirit-filled Pentecostal element. And I want to encourage you, there's nothing wrong with hearing the prophetic. As a matter of fact, we welcome it and we should welcome it. Paul said that we are not to despise those things. Hello? Forbid not to speak in tongues. 
Despise not prophecies. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Amen. But there's a problem here because this had lives in the balance. It had an intent to keep the will of God from taking place. Listen, I want you to know that God wants you and I seeking his will, to know what it is he's doing, to pursue him. His will is righteousness in the earth. His will is holiness in his house. His will is to be like Jesus, for you and I to be like Jesus. And when prophecy says that, but then begins to point you some other direction, when prophecy touches on that, but then goes somewhere else, you need need to break and go. You need to stop and run. Because the moment it goes away from that, if it's not directing you to Jesus Christ, the moment anybody is a preacher or singer, the moment somebody teaching God's word or explaining God's word begins to take you away from the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and soon coming of Jesus Christ, they, my friend, are deceiving you. I don't care if it's an angel from heaven. So be careful, okay? If Nehemiah had a false prophet show up, you and I are going to have, and I just feel like I'm supposed to warn you this week in in the days coming, you're going to see some of this. Now, in the New Testament, it's interesting that often the phrase ability to is used with prophecy. If he has the ability to prophesy, let him. If, If you have the ability. So that ability to, and then there's this other thing from 1 Corinthians 14, 29, Prophesy and, then I'm going to quote, let the others evaluate. And what's happened, because we're all on Facebook and we all have cameras in our phones and we can all be seen by the whole world in 12 seconds, it's, what's happening is there's a lot of prophecy but no evaluation. Church, we need to slow down, take a time out, and remember that God's word is open to evaluation as it comes through us. Right? Notice how I said it. God's word is open. It's always open because you can evaluate until the cows come home and it's still God's word. But as it comes through us, it can be uh, uh, tainted by our influences. It can be uh, uh, kind of off kilter. And, and so we have to be willing to evaluate it in each other. The greatest thing I face is not preparation for these messages each week or each time I give one, but and not even the delivery, but the realization that I'm going to answer to God for everything I said and how it affected God's people. In my generation, Maybe guys 10 plus years older than me, but certainly my generation, everything I've ever preached has been recorded. It's 4,000 plus messages. 4,000. And every word has been recorded here. Back in the day it was cassettes. But it's also been recorded there. Amen. All right, here's, here's the last thing. I'll tie a little bit. I'll try to tie that together in a moment and help you understand. Go to Daniel chapter 9 because some of you are just like, I don't understand what in the world prophecy matters on a Sunday morning. <clears throat> Go to Daniel. Excuse me, Daniel chapter 9. Look at verse 24. Daniel. One of the things that gets a little bit confusing about the Old Testament is chronologically it kind of it kind of goes sideways and you you lose where you are you know it's uh, that you're through Judges and Joshua Judges they come into the land they get their kings and it's Saul and then Samuel or excuse me Saul and then David and then uh, <clears throat> Solomon. And then it, you just kind of, whoa, whoa, whoa. And Ezra and Nehemiah come along. And so by this time, you're supposed to understand that the people have been exiled. We don't read anything really about them being there much. But then they come back. Well, then you get into all these other books, and they come back to Daniel. Daniel is not chronologically at that place where we find him in the Old Testament. Look at verse 24, chapter 9, verse 24. It must be on the screens. I see you looking there. Ah, but there's the pages. 
A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, this is a prophecy coming directly from heaven. So let's look at what it says. There's a period of time that's established, and what it's going to do is bring an end to the rebellion of people, Jewish people, to put an end to their sin. Hallelujah. How many of you believe that God is a lot more upset with sin than we are? How upset do you think he is? Do you think he's upset with sin in general or specific sin? <laughs> and if it's specific sin, whose specific sin is he more upset with? Like, Mine or yours? <laughs> if you're asking me, it's definitely yours. <laughs> if you read Nehemiah, one of the things that he does, you see it in there early on, he confesses. But when he goes into that prayer of confession, Daniel does, or, yeah, excuse me, Daniel does the same thing. A prayer of confession, when they get into it, when the anointing comes on them, you can see them both praying, forgive me of my sin. And there's no doubt, even though it wasn't recorded, that they go into, I would imagine, a time of specifying what some of that is. Because when you enter the presence of God, he makes you aware of exactly what you're carrying. All right. Praise God. Glad he makes me aware of mine and not you aware of mine. Or me aware of yours. <laughs> this is what happens when God's moving. He puts an end to sin. He atones for guilt. He brings in righteousness and he confirms the prophetic vision, anointing the most holy place. Now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time of command. From the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will, will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. After this period of 62 sets, of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing, and a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood and war, and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. Oh, okay, so we're talking about two different ends here. There's an end kind of associated with the, whole, the anointed one, but then there's an end of the end. And until the end end, war and its miseries are decreed from... How many of you feel like we're living in misery? Right? You just feel like, oh, praise God. Well, we're living right as the Bible described it would be. War and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object. And that's what you might consider to be an epic idol that causes desecration until the fate decreed a for this defiler is finally poured out on him. Number one, if we're going to get God's help, we must know he will fight for us. Number two, we must know what he has said. We've got to know it. Not what somebody else said. We've got to know what he said. Amen. And number three, we've got to know that he is in control. Someday there will be an end to sin. Glory to God. You know, what he's describing here is that after the anointed one would come, and we know that he brought healing, he brought deliverance, he raised the dead, he fed multitudes, he did miracles, all kinds of incredible things. He never stole anything from anybody. He never spoke poorly of anybody except directly to them in an effort to change them. He never hurt anybody. He never led an insurrection against the government, never stormed the capital, never did anything. And yet they killed him. And Daniel is being told basically that when, when the anointed one comes, his end is going to look like nothing good happened. If you and I were standing there that day, it would have looked like nothing good happened. Blood everywhere. On top of the blood was water. When they pierced his side with the spear, water poured out. And now there's just this muddy, bloody mess. His body is ripped shredded in ways that no one can fully comprehend. Not shredded like we use the word shredded, and meaning you've got defined muscles, I believe. Like I'm... 
women shredded like torn to pieces. The mud and the blood was flowing down off that hillside as people hung their heads. The darkness had been so thick it was hard to even see what was hanging there on the cross. But now as the darkness began to lift, they could clearly see the residue of what they had done. I can only imagine that there was very little in the way of sounds. But through that stillness, the Roman, the Roman soldier in charge of his little group said, Oh, God in heaven, what have we done? This was the Son of God. They took him from there and placed him, as you and I know, in a tomb that had never been defiled by death. It was freshly hewn out of the stone hillside there. Nobody's sure today exactly where it's at, but if you go there, they'll show you one that sure could fit the bill. It's very low in the opening, tiny little opening. You stoop to go in, and it's just a small room, if you would call it that. It's nothing but a square inside the rock. And there on a rocky slab to your right is where possibly the body of the king of glory might have been while it was waiting. The stone that they rolled back over was not enough, and so they sealed it with the insignia of the of the guy that had put him there on the cross and said, here are soldiers so that if anybody comes and steals the body, they'll be executed on the spot. Nobody is going to steal his body. As you and I know, on that day of the great resurrection, that day that the song says, that great getting up morning, whenever they women, the women came there, they realized that his body is not here. We can see it because the soldiers are gone. They've been knocked out and then uh, left there as if they were dead. And when they come to, they have to run into town and say, we have a big problem. And the women run back to the apostles and say, we have a big problem. But that problem to the unbelievers was much different than it was to the believers. It's the same problem. The body wasn't there. But for the believers, (laughs) hallelujah, just a week prior to this, I told you on Easter on that day of arrival, what we call the triumphal entry, as Pilate came in from the one side, Jesus came in from the other side. At that moment of him entering into Jerusalem, with the crowd screaming, Hosanna, blessed is the Son of God. The clock in heaven struck midnight. When Nehemiah went to the king, and the king said, remember I told you verse 5 of chapter 2, And Nehemiah says, I need to go rebuild the city. The city has to be rebuilt. There's something inside of me. I know that I might be killed for even asking you. I'm the cupbearer. I'm the one that has to make sure everything you're about to drink is not poisoned. Everything that you're about to eat is not poisoned. The cupbearer was the person between the king and life, the king and assassination. And it happened all the time. And so the cupbearer would pour out a little bit of the of the whatever he was drinking from the bottle into his hand and sip it. Then the king would watch him pour it into the glass and ever so softly, daintily, he would take that and hand it to the king, assuring him that there was nothing that would harm him in that drink or in that food. And at that moment when the king said, go and rebuild the city, the clock began. And Daniel was told that it would be basically 69 sets of seven years. 400, do the math, 483. As Jesus is coming down that hillside, it's exactly 483 years to the day. And he comes into Jerusalem and he looks. And then the Bible says, he leaves. And sometimes when you're in the midst of your battle, and and you know that God has spoken, 
And he's encouraged you, and you know it's God. It's not a deceptive or, or misled prophecy. You know it's God speaking, and you're holding on to it with everything, and the Lord has come, and then you just kind of feel like he's gone. He, he was there for a moment. You were certain of it. You felt it. You experienced it. You, you knew it. As surely as I'm standing here, you're sitting there, you knew that God had done something, had showed up, but now he, he's left the scene, and you think, I, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Where's God in the midst of all of this? Listen, everything's right on time. Everything is still just as God had planned it. What you and I have to do is be careful that we don't put our own spin on it, that we don't have to see God do it our way. But when we can let him do it his way, when we can say, oh, God, have your way, no matter what happens, no matter what the result is, I know that you will be glorified. I know that people will see Jesus because of you. If you'll have your way in me and through me, if you'll do with me and through me what you want to do, I know that that help is enough. Listen, friend, how will you know that God is with you? Because no matter what's happening, you'll be talking about Jesus. No matter what's happening, you'll be confident that he's with you. No matter what's happening, no matter what your eyes show you, no matter what your circumstances tell you, you will know that he is right on time, that he has come in answer to your prayers. And because it's the moment that God wants him there, when he rode into Jerusalem, who could have imagined that the clock was striking midnight and he was here? I don't know about that day, but I can tell you about a day that's the second clock. It started over after that day, and the clock got rewound. And God said, I'm telling you, from this day until the end, war and its misery is determined, but there will be an end, and Jesus Christ will return. Hallelujah. It won't be Steve Jobs showing up on a white horse. It's not going to be somebody from Microsoft or the government telling you that everything's going to be fine. It's not going to be Bill Gates coming and give you a microchip. It's going to be Jesus Christ coming back for the blood-bought church. Hallelujah. And the closer he gets, the tighter we're getting. Because there's nobody out there that likes us. We've got enemies. Right? You'd think they'd find Jesus after they start destroying each other and say, well, this, i got to get out of this lifestyle. This is crazy. Well, I thought everything was beautiful over here, but they're, they're just devouring me like I'm one of the Christians. They're just eating me up like I'm a believer. I need to become a believer. I might as well be a believer if I'm going to pay this kind. No, they're not going to do that. A few. But you and I, we have God's help. We have God's help. God's help. I'm telling you, you have his help. Now, Nehemiah's not alive today. Nobody lives forever apart from Jesus. We have to say, Lord, bring us through. Amen. Lord, bring us through. Let's talk to him for a moment today. Bow your hearts with me. Father, your timing is always perfect. Your timing is always perfect. Daniel spoke 80 to 100 years before Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem. And you were right on time. You kept track of every second of every day. And you're doing that in my life and in the life of every brother and sister of mine here today. You're taking care of them. You know the very numbers of hair on their head. You know everything about them. You know not only the blood in their veins, but every cell in that blood. You know everything about them. You know the struggles that they face, and you know the challenges that they don't seem to be able to overcome. You know the mountains and obstacles in their way, and you know how you're going to move the mountain. You know exactly what you're going to do. You know the victory that you're going to bring so that your name is glorified. You know exactly what's going to happen so that people say the Lord lives. Thank you today. Now, brothers and sisters, whatever it is that you're looking at, however it is that you need God's help, 
probably not a person in this building that wouldn't say this morning, I need God's help. I need God's help in this or that or the other. Whatever that is, you take that one thing right now and you say to the Lord, your timing is perfect. Your timing is perfect. Your timing is perfect. Would you move my mountain so that you can get glory? Would you move my mountain so that you can receive praise, adoration? Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. If you're able to, would you stand with me this morning, church? I had a message together I've been really working on for, well, since the middle of last week on the Holy Spirit. And uh, really struggled with it, struggled, and just didn't feel like God was in it yet. And um, just opened my Bible yesterday to Nehemiah and saw that verse. God will help us. And I thought the Holy Spirit nudged me to remind you that he is here to help us. He's here to help us. Amen. I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray for your needs, first of all, above all else. Whatever you're facing, some of you might be facing financial challenges and difficulties, and you got stimulus money from the government, but it didn't, it, it didn't make it, didn't last. Or you, maybe your business is suffering. Some of you, I know, a couple of you I mentioned earlier, you're medically, you're just believing God somewhere on this journey, that hand of God is going to fall upon me, and I'm going to be healed and give you glory. Some of you, it's um, relational. There are just great divides between you and a loved one or you and a co-worker. You've been crying out to God because it, it makes it to where you don't want to eat and you're having trouble sleeping. And you need God's help. Nobody knows what's been going on. You're the only one, and you've not told anybody because you know what's going to happen if you do. And you, you can't solve it that way. You need God's help. It's got to be God, or too many people will be hurt, or you might lose your job, or whatever it is. I'm going to pray, and as I do, I want you to come this morning, and I want us to just stand in the Lord's presence, you and I together, because we're going to say to the Lord, Father, I need your help today. Like the Jews that came into the city to rebuild. You know, the Bible makes a big deal that 52 days later that wall was finished. Nobody believed it could be done in 52 years. They did in 52 days. Nobody believed it would have any strength. They were mocking them. Oh, if, if a rat runs across it, it'll all fall down. They said, Fox. Jesus rode into Jerusalem that was the wall that he rode through the gates every stone that Nehemiah put there was still there through the centuries God had made sure the wall stood he's going to make sure that you stand Father this morning in this house of miracles I pray for breakthrough and deliverance. I pray for healing and restoration. In this house of miracles, may this be a place where there's bread, Lord, in, in a place of Bethel, house of God that has bread. Would you give us bread this morning, Lord, for our journey? Bread that's supernatural. Bread that is the broken body of Jesus that has healing in it. Bread that leads us to recognize the power of God. Bread that sustains us in the wilderness. Bread that helps us when we don't know what to do. Lord, I pray for miracles in this place. I pray for healing in this place. Lord, I pray for your help this morning in situations that we can't even begin to describe. Lord, we believe for your help today. We believe for your help today. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Come on, slip out of where you are. Let's, let's just stand in the presence of God this morning for just two minutes before we get out of here. For just two minutes on this day, and we say, oh, God, I need your help. Whatever it is, I don't know. You don't have to tell anybody, but we just say, God, today I need your help. I need your help. Somebody here today, you have a, a, a loved one on drugs, and it's bad, worse than you've ever seen it, and today you need God's help. Somebody here, you're making a decision for a loved one whether they should be taken in for psychiatric evaluation and you're, you just don't know what to do. You're overwhelmed with it. God's going to help us. God's going to help us. Hallelujah. I want some of you ladies to step in behind, Sister Linda, and I want some of you guys to step in behind Brother, Brother Tom. Where's she at? Right there. They're already praying for him. Now, when you're with your group, your family, your, your unit, tighten up with your unit. You don't have to tighten up with the others. But today, just tighten up with your unit. If you're, if you're here by yourself and there's somebody standing next to you, tighten, you don't have to hold their hand or anything, but just make sure you're close. Because when the trumpet sounds, when the trumpet sounds, we gotta be tight. We gotta be tight. those of you who are on the prayer team or your pastors or credential holders, ministers, you come in behind somebody and just find, find somebody, move in behind and just begin to pray. Come on, let's, let's worship the Lord for a moment this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. King of glory, Jesus, all of the meaning tied up in that moment you entered into Jerusalem. How pivotal, how transformative the ending of one calendar but the launch of another one. We know that the same Jesus that came the first time is coming back the second time. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 